All right, welcome back, friends. We are on part 15 of Where Did the Book of Mormon Come From? And now we want to look at the, the life of Sidney Rigdon. So he was born in St. Clair Township, Pennsylvania, Algahanny County, Pennsylvania, on February 19th, 1793. Notice this is located 10 miles south of Pittsburgh. Remember, this is the place in Pittsburgh is where, he, where the manuscript found was published at R.J. Patterson from 1812 to 1816. So it, it's located 10 miles south of Pittsburgh, an area known as Library, Pennsylvania today. He was the youngest son of William and Nancy Rignan. He had a limited education due to the lack of funds to pay for it by his parents. But he would educate himself by staying up at night by the fire, reading the Bible and other books. He was definitely a lover of books. His family's religious ed background was Baptist, and he went to Peters Creek Baptist Church. In 1817 to 1818, he left the farm to join Andrew Clark of the Providence Baptist Church in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Later in 1819, he came to Warren, Ohio. He joined in the ministry of Adams and Bentley, his future brother-in-law, because he was to be wedded to his sister Phoebe uh, Brooks on June 12, 1820. Rigdon most likely came into contact for the first time with the American Restoration Movement when he read a pamphlet of Alexander Campbell and John Walker debate on the subject of baptism, or infant baptism, really. Bentley, a longtime acquaintance of Campbell, wanted Rigdon to meet Campbell. They met and were able to strike up a long conversation about a variety of religious subjects, and even Rigdon readily admitted that if he had, within the last year, taught and promulgated from the pulpit over one error, um, he would have had a thousand. Campbell desired to use Rigdon because of his exceptional abilities and secured him a position at the First Baptist Church of Pittsburgh in 1822. That was a hearing to restoration principles. He gained much momentum and popularity as a preacher in that area. Rigdon prom propagated Campbell's restoration principles entitled Restoration of the Ancient Order of Things, and it was published in the uh, Christian Baptist. That was a magazine that was made by Alexander Campbell from 1825 to 1829. In 1825 to 1826, Rigdon moved to Bainbridge, Ohio, where he became a very popular preacher in the Restoration Movement uh, from 1827 uh, to 1834 for the Mentor Baptist Church. During his time at Mentor, Rigdon opposed Campbell on some doctrinal differences, such as uh, divine authorization for church leadership, the reemergence of the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and believe me, we're going to talk about that. Do you remember what we said in our first video? We said there's a contradiction between the Bible and the Book of Mormon. And that is, the Age of Miracles was limited to the first century AD. But what do we see in the Book of Mormon, friends? We saw that there was this idea given that uh, miracles were to last. And so, I would propose to you that Rigdon was a part of that. And then, the communal... Quanonia or uh, uh, fellowship in which they had all things in common from Acts 2.44 and which very interesting enough a few times in the Book of Mormon we have this idea of communal living also presented. We'll talk more about that later. In 1830, Rigdon advocated his ideals of communitarianism at the Austin Town meeting of the Mahoning Association but they were crushed by Campbell. This is plausibly the turning point where Rigdon turned his back on the rest, American Restoration Movement. Uh, Van Wagner says in his biography, uh, Regardless of his reasons, Rigdon was deeply crushed by Campbell's rejection, and he was not the type to feel no rancor. Scorn infuriated him and, infuriated him and left him with the urge to retaliate. En route to his home and mentor, he stopped at a friend's house and commented, I have done as much in this Reformation as Campbell or Scott talking about Alexander Campbell or Walter Scott, and yet they get all the honor. In October 1830, uh, four, missionary, four Mormon missionaries came due to Parley Pratt to see Rigdon, who was Pratt's um, former mentor. At first, Rigdon did not believe their message of the Book of Mormon, but then he examined the Book of Mormon and discovered doctrines he already believed to be true, which, very interesting enough, he probably had placed in it and claimed to receive a sign from God that the LDS religion was true. He gave his newly found testimony to the congregation, and many of them were convict, convinced of his testimony and became Mormons. There was a successful Mormon conversion rate of about 1,000 souls over the next few weeks. Now, 
Here, here's a question that I like for a Latter-day Saint to ask, or to ask. Do you think if um, the four men, the four missionaries, had never come to uh, Mentor, or sorry, was it Mentor or Kirtland? Maybe it was Mentor, I'm sorry. Do you think the LDS Church would have grown in its rapid rate as it had? Would the church growth ha- rate had been very strong if Rigdon wasn't a part, uh, was never a part of it in the first place? Because we see that the the LDS Church grew uh, quite quite a bit during that time period. Anyways, that's just a question I have. If anyone wants to answer, in December of eighteen thirty, Rigdon departed from Mentor and Palma- to Palmyra, New York, to visit Joseph Smith, the prophet of this new religion. Rigdon was established um, very early in the leadership of the Mormon Church, and I think that's very interesting, and served in various capacities over the next decade from 1830 to 1844. Throughout Mormon history, Rigdon was involved with, one, the Kirtland Bank incident, two, attacking the characters of those who left the Mormon Church, three, his famous salt sermon on July 4th, 1838, advocating Mormon retaliation, Four, one of the conditions of the Treaty of Far West Missouri was for the arrest of Sidney Rigdon and other Mormon leaders in 1838 and many other events, especially, did you know that Joseph Smith actually uh, ran for president? And do you, can you guess who would be, be his vice president? Sidney Rigdon. Now, here's the interesting thing that, oh, and I wrote that down there, uh, and this is from LDS source here. They state, uh, Bitten and Alexander State, during the Ohio period, Missouri period, and Illinois period of Mormon history, Rigdon was a prominent figure. He participated with Joseph Smith in the Grand Revelation on the grant, Graded Salvation of Souls After Death, Section 76 of Doctrine and Covenants. He became a counselor in the First Presidency. He taught classes in Kirtland, Ohio, and assisted in preparing a lecture series, Lectures on Faith. In Illinois, he served on the Nauvoo City Council and as a postmaster. When Joseph Smith declared his candidacy for president of the United States, Rigdon became the vice presidential candidate. Um, in 1844, oh, sorry. In a, um, I accidentally put um, the footnotes down there again. So let me read. In 1844, Rigdon tried to seize power as a new president of the church, or... Uh, maybe I should say he wanted to become guardian of the church when Joseph Smith was killed by a mob in Carthage, Illinois. I find that very interesting. Both Rigdon and Brigham Young gave their speeches on why each of them should fulfill the position, but the audience was influenced more by Brigham Young. Rigdon was excommunicated by the LDS Church for not complying with the leadership. Rigdon left for Pittsburgh and started an LDS splinter group in that city. In 1845, the Rigdon family moved to Antrim Township, Pennsylvania, where he did make one more Serious attempt to gather the saints at a new Zion. Knowles explains in May of 1846, the Rigdon family, along with some of his followers, left Pittsburgh to establish Adventure Farm near Greencastle, accompanied by Rigdon's visionary apocalyptic promises. But when Christ delayed his coming, Rigdon's few followers became discouraged. His church dissolved and the farm property was foreclosed upon because the balance could not be paid to its creditor. The Rigdon family was financially poor and had to move in with his son-in-law, George Robinson, near Cuba, New York. In 1850, Robinson put up the proper, his property for sale and had the Rigdon family move in with him again in Friendship, New York. In 1856, Rigdon received a letter from Stephen Post, a one-time Latter-day Saint, who until recently had been a Strangite. And that's a really interesting history, too, uh, to re- read about James Strange, who... Interesting enough, um, you, you should read about it, uh, about his history, and you'll find out why. Uh, Post, then living in Centerville, Pennsylvania, was like Rigdon, a fervent seeker of the redemption of Zion. Their correspondence back and forth would last for 25 years. Post attempted another Mormon restoration movement on Sidney's behalf, but it was never really successful. In 1863, he was given the chance by Brigham Young to live in New- Utah, but he cl- declined, as no states... As Sidney grew older, his private religious statements and beliefs became more bizarre. Sidney Rigdon died on July 14, 1876, after experiencing a number of strokes and was buried in the Friendship Village graveyard. So, um, I see you, you can kind of get an idea of the overview of his life. But we're going to talk more 
uh, deeper about him. I wanted you to see where he grew up at, where he was born. So you can see uh, Spalding lived in the Pittsburgh area, uh, autumn of 1812, and then you'll remember he moved down south to Amity, Pennsylvania. And then what you'll see there is Rigdon was born in St. Clair Township, uh, which is also which is ten miles south of Pittsburgh. Um, I wish I could I should have put Amity on there, but I'm sorry I didn't. Um, but it's known as Library, Pennsylvania today, as we said. I wanted to zoom in on on where he lives, so you can see the Rigdon Farm there, and you can see how far Pittsburgh is from from that. And then if you zoom in more, there's Sydney Rigdon on the left and Carville Rigdon on the right. Now, let's talk a little bit about a description. Uh, and this description of Sidney Regnan, I think, helps fit that he could have been part of the authorship of the Book of Mormon. He loved to read. Wycliffe Rigdon said about him, Sidney was never to play with the boys. Reading book was the greatest pleasure he could get. And even Sidney Rigdon, in an autobiography of him, said he had an insatiable thirst for reading. Um, he would believe he was called of God. He would say to Stephen Post, from his earliest infancy, my fear saith the Lord was the ruling principle in his heart. I, the Lord, called him from his plows. I did Amos from among the herdsmen of Tekoa. He was very devoted to the study of the Bible from his earliest infancy. As you can see, the fear of God was the ruling principle in his heart. In consequence of this, he was devoted to the study of the Bible. Number four, he was actually deceptive. He made up his own conversion experience. Years later, as a Latter-day Saint, he reports on his former Baptist conversion. When I joined the church, I knew I could not be admitted without an experience, so I made one up, uh, made up one to suit the purpose, but it was all made up and was no, no use. He was a great orator, they said. Amos Hayden says, On my visits to Pittsburgh in those days, being a member and minister of the Redstone Baptist Association, I spoke to the Baptist church in that city. The result was that with the exception of some 12 persons, the whole church, over 100 members, were theoretically reformers. In 1822, I induced Sidney Renand, and a Baptist minister of Ohio, to accept a call to the church in Pittsburgh. Number six, the character of, of Sidney Renand. Alexander Campbell says, Renand was pet, petulant, unreliable, and ungovernable in his passions, and his wayward temper, his extravagant stories, and his habit of self-exertion prevented him from attaining influence. As a religious teacher among the disciples. Now, I'll admit that um, Campbell does have some bias here because he wrote this after uh, Campbell had left the disciples. He was a Bible scholar. Uh, David Whitmer says, Rigdon was a thorough Bible scholar, a man of fine education, and a powerful orator. He soon worked himself deep into Brother Joseph Smith's affections and had more influence over him than any other man living. He was Brother Joseph's private counselor, his most intimate friend and brother for some time after they met. Brother Joseph rejoiced, believing that the Lord had sent to him, this, to this great and mighty man, Sidney Rigdon, to help him in the work. A.W. Keller says, He found in himself an insatiable thirst for reading. He read history, divinity, and general literature without much method or aim except to gratify his intense love of reading. He gave a great attention to the Bible, made himself very familiar with all parts of it, he readily committed to memory and thus stored up a large portions of the most attractive portions of the Bible. And then Alexander Campbell would say Rigdon was a flaming literalist of the school of Elias Smith, a millenarian of the first war. So he did believe in, um, we don't have time to get into the doctrine of the millennium. So just to let you know, he believed in this doctrine of the millennium. Uh, eight different mood swings, maybe due to an accident. So his, one of his his brother, Lalami, said, who was a doctor, he says, he received such a contusion of the brain as ever afterwards seriously affected his character, and in some respects his conduct. His mental powers did not seem to be impaired, but the equilibrium of his intellectual exertions seems thereby to have been sadly affected. He still maintained great uh, mental activity and power, but was to an equal degree inclined to run into wild and visionary views at, on almost every question. Alexander Campbell would say he had a peculiar mental and corporal malady. While I would say Sidney Regan spoke very rapidly, used to get tremendously excited so that he foamed at the mouth. Neil Whitney, I was well acquainted with Elder Regan a number of years before he came into this church. He was always either in the bottom of the cellar or up in the garret window. 
Grant would say, Elder Reading would not only soar, as it were, to the highest heaven in raptures of delight, but when dark clouds overspread his horizon, he would also sink into the lowest state of despondency. Reading did think of himself as a prophet. He says, I'm going to fight a real bloody battle with sword and with gun. I will fight the battles of the Lord. I will also cross the Atlantic, encounter the Queen's forces, talking about the Queen of England, and overcome them. Plant the American standard on English ground, then march to the palace of Her Majesty and demand a portion of her riches and dominions, which if she refuse, I will take the little madam by the nose and lead her out, and she shall have no power to help herself. If I do not do this, the Lord never spake by mortal. And then he supposedly offered to Stephen Post revelations. And here's one some some of them. And now I saw the Lord call thee to a great work in assisting my servant Sidney Rigdon in preparing the way before me, and Elijah wished should come. And I came unto thee as my servant Sidney Rigdon assisted my servant Joseph Smith with all of his might, mind, and strength. I have called thee to assist my servant Sidney Rigdon. Thine eyes shall see mine elect gather in Zion redeem. Thou shalt shout hosannas in the midst of my people, and while Babylon shall shake and tremble, and inhabitants thereof shall quake with fear, and howl and weep. And mourn for anguish of so, even more, even so. Amen. Now, what's really interesting to me is this language here. Read Doctrine and Covenants and see if you don't see similar language being used. You can see how Sidney Ringdon was really good at copying biblical language. No doubt about that. He also has some others. The Word of the Lord, which came to Phoebe. His wife, he's talking about his prophetess, saying to his servant Stephen, Beware, beware of pride, saith the Lord, and Ryan, for thou art in danger of falling under condemnation by reason of it. Do all things that thou hast doest in relation to Zion and great meekness and humility before me. I send this as delivered to me by her whom the Lord has chosen and ordained to warn the sons of Zion when they are in danger. For I, the Lord, have decreed a consumption in all the regions of this country, laying between what you call the Atlantic on the east and the Mississippi on the west, and between the Gulf of Mexico on the south and the Great Lakes on the north, as is named among you. And I further say that as to you, my servants, that it will be to your advantage when you go to such a home that you go so far west as a place known as Council Bluffs in Iowa. So he was certainly able of writing something like akin to Scripture, right? And what's interesting is it has been said that Walter Scott and Sidney Rennan wrote a, a satire piece called The Third Epistle of Peter when he lived in Pittsburgh. And I find that very interesting. And you can read that um, in the Christian Baptist, um, July 4th, 1825, pages 280 through 288. So think about this, friends. We got someone who loves to read. So you got someone who's definitely pouring forth information uh, into their brain, learning a lot, believed he was called of God, so he believes he has authority, right? He's devoted to a study of the Bible, so he knows his Bible very well. He sadly was deceptive, made up his own conversion experience. So, I mean, to me, um, he was kind of a little pragmatic. Well, he's not the end justifies the means, so to speak. Uh, he was an orator, great orator. His character was definitely questionable. Um, you know, he was sometimes, as some others said, he was very high up sometimes, had some mood swings, but also very depressing, depressing sometimes. He was a Bible scholar, as said by some, different mood swings, thought of himself as a prophet, and could easily make up scriptures that match the Bible. So to me, that matches someone perfectly who is able to put in the religious part of what we call the Book of Mormon and transforming it into the Book of Mormon. Now, we'll get into this next time. Um, so we're going to stop there, and I hope that you'll turn, and we're going to do this in just a few minutes. So stay tuned. Thank you so much for being with us.